after a fire broke out in the kitchen of their apartment. Details are still emerging, but our fire commissioner, Daniel Nigro, said it's believed to be an accident. This is a horrific, horrific tragedy. It is heartbreaking. And I know I speak for everyone here when I say our condolences to the surviving members of the Paul Dorr family. This fire took place in Councilmember Perkins' district, and I know that he is working with the FDNY and OEM to help the community in this very painful and difficult time. I ask everyone here to please keep this family in their thoughts and prayers. I also want to thank the FDNY for their efforts. About 100 members of the fire department responded to the scene within three minutes and tried valiantly to rescue the family, but the fire was too much. Again, our deepest condolences go out to the Polidor family. And as we always do here at Stated today, we're going to acknowledge those, sadly, who have succumbed to 9-11 related illnesses. This week, I mean, this is hard. This week, I'm sad to report we have lost nine first responders. Nine first responders from 9-11 related illnesses. Their Air Force National Guardsman, Mark Pelton, 52 years old. Belmore Merrick EMS Chief, Thomas DeFranceschi, 61 years old. New Jersey State Police Sergeant, Brian McCoy, 57 years old. Captain Howard Vanetsky, a 23-year veteran of the fire department. NYPD Detective Charles Humphrey, NYPD Officer Patrick McGovern, 43 years old, a 19-year veteran of the police force. NYPD Detective Lisa Rosado, 51 years old. NYPD Officer Jeffrey Healy, 52 years old and a 21-year veteran of the NYPD. NYPD Detective Lawrence Larry Cummings, 74 years old. These are heroes. These are people who served our city. And my condolences go out to them, to their friends and to their family. I want to take this time to applaud the work of the New York Congressional Delegation in pushing for fully funding the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. I urge the rest of Congress to finally please follow their lead. This is an issue for New York City. It's an issue for the entire country. And it is so important that we take care of these people who sacrifice so much for our city in one of the darkest, most painful moments of American history and one of the most painful moments our city has ever had to deal with. On Tuesday, Lawrence J. Hanley, the international president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, passed away suddenly. He began his career as a bus driver in Brooklyn, and he quickly became involved in the labor movement. He spent his life fighting for workers' rights, and for that, we all owe him a huge debt of gratitude. We extend our deepest condolences to his family. In addition, New York City lost two longtime public servants this past weekend. Queens District Attorney Judge Richard Brown passed away Saturday. He was 86 years old, and he had spent decades in public service, including at the state legislature. He worked so hard on behalf of this city. He loved this city with all of his heart. Decades of public service at every level of government. And I am extraordinarily grateful for Judge Brown's service. And I wasn't able to be there yesterday for his service. I was in Albany, but I heard it was beautiful and that people were really able to remember what an amazing man he was, public servant he was. On Sunday, the city council lost our beloved colleague and friend, Lou Fiddler. From 2002 to 2013, Lou represented the 46th district in Southern Brooklyn, but his advocacy extended far beyond his neighborhood. Lou was a champion for young people that society often neglected, and he saved many, many lives. He was a voice for the voiceless. Being chair of the Youth Services Committee was one of Lou's proudest accomplishments, and he put his heart and soul into advocating for New York City's children and teenagers. 
the idea that we needed to have adequate emergency and transitional housing for runaway and homeless youth was barely a blip on the radar screen until Lou Fiddler came along. He toured shelters relentlessly, talked and met with young people, worked with service providers, and fought like hell for the city to fund beds and services for those that our system and society had forgotten. Importantly, Lou made sure that LGBTQ youth had places to stay where they would feel safe and accepted. Lou believed that every young person deserved mentorship and job opportunities, and he called for the expansion of the Summer Youth Employment Program that became a mantra of his during every budget season that he served in the New York City Council. He was also a champion for our environment at a time when legislatures were just beginning to understand it was imperative to act in order to take care of our planet. Lou sponsored groundbreaking legislation banning styrofoam, expanding the designation of recyclable plastics, and requiring DSNY to do significant outreach and education on the importance of recycling. For Lou, saving our planet meant taking care of our children and future generations. For Lou, it was always about kids. And I know that because of the love he had for his own two kids, Max and Harry, and for his wife, Robin. I know we all loved Lou, and we are going to miss him. We lost one of our own. He was smart, he was funny, he was very funny, he was kind, he loved a good argument and loved the Mets. He was totally committed to New York City and to his family. I was looking back, actually, when I got the news over the weekend, and I found a message that he sent me a week after being elected speaker. And he said, when, how quickly can you pass a bill to raise the age for young people to be able to stay in the youth shelters and not go into the adult shelters. And the day of the hearing, he showed up here and he sat through the, he sat on the riser right there. He sat through the entire hearing and he talked to every single young person after they testified. This was one of his life missions. He was so deeply committed to this. And when I go around the city of New York, when I go to the Ellie Forney Center or to Covenant House, or to any of these organizations that do this work, Lou Fiddler is literally their hero. He was their hero, their champion, their pit bull, whose advocacy and passion on this issue did not just last for the time that he was in the New York City Council, but five and a half years after he was out of the City Council, he's still showing up at events, still showing up at youth shelters, still coming to budget hearings and to oversight hearings. He led with his heart. Lou Fiddler was one of a kind. I am deeply grateful for his friendship. I'm deeply grateful for everything he did for this body, for his district in Brooklyn, for the borough that he loved, and for the city of New York, which he was a champion for. And I want to give a big round of applause to our friend and colleague, Lou Fiddler. To his wife Robin and their two sons, Max and Harry, we send our deepest, deepest condolences. I know there was a funeral service yesterday. Again, I was in Albany, but um, I heard it was very beautiful. And I'm thinking of his family at this very painful and difficult time. And finally, I want to add that um, Robert Pear, a New York Times reporter, passed away last night um, from a sudden stroke. I was a huge fan of his work. He was probably the most accomplished healthcare writer in the United States of America. He cover, covered the Affordable Care Act and had been writing for the New York Times for 40 years. Readers and his colleagues have been writing tributes all day long on social media. Uh, and what they've said is he's probably one of the greatest journalists to ever mm -hmm. have his name in the New York Times. But also they say he was the kindest human being. His, he said, they said he was the nicest guy to all of his competitors. He would help his competitors with stories. And it is a big loss for this country to lose someone of that sterling reputation who is covering 
issues of importance to the United States of America. We expend our deepest sympathies to his colleagues, his friends, and his families. So in honor of the Paul Dor family, National Guardsman Mark Pelton, Chief Thomas DeFranciski, Sergeant Brian McCoy, Captain Howard Vinetsky, Detective Charles Humphrey, Officer Patrick McGovern, Detective Lisa Rosado, Officer Jeffrey Healy, Detective Larry Cummings, Lawrence J. Hanley, District Attorney and Judge Richard Brown, the amazing Council Member Lou Fiddler, and Robert Pear, I ask that we all rise and take a moment of silence. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that May is Asian Heritage Month. New York City's Asian community dates back to the early 1800s, and it has always been instrumental in making our city the greatest city in the world. I am proud of my own Asian heritage. I'm a quarter Korean, and I encourage everyone to learn more about the different Asian cultures and their contributions to our city and to our country. We are also in the midst of Ramadan, so I want to take a moment and wish all of our Muslim friends and neighbors and constituents an easy fast, uh, Ramadan Mubarak. And this Sunday is Mother's Day, and I want to uh, acknowledge all of the amazing mothers here in the city council. Uh, I'm really grateful for everything that you all do. I think everyone knows how much I adore my own amazing uh, mom. I love her. She's my best friend, and um, I couldn't... I couldn't do anything I do without her. Um, so I want to thank you all, to all the council members and to the staff members and to anyone who's here at the city council that is a mother. I want to thank you uh, for the work you do every single day and making our, our world a better and more loving place. Uh, you're raising the future of New York City and we're grateful to you, so happy Mother's Day. So I want to dive into the agenda for today. The council will vote on the following Article 11 property tax exemptions approved by the Council's Committee on Finance. Putnam Gardens in Councilmember Cohen's District, 2997 Marion Avenue in Councilmember Cohen's District, Soundview Park Townhouses in Councilmember Diaz Sr.'s District, Apex Place Phase 1 in Councilmember Kozowitz's District, Apex Place Phase 2 in Councilmember Kozowitz's District, and we're going to vote on the following land use actions. 270 Park Avenue, an application in Councilmember Keith Powers' District for a zoning text amendment to facilitate a new 70-story office building that will serve as the new headquarters for J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. This is the first site to take advantage of the East Midtown rezoning, which passed in the Council in 2017. I know that Councilmember Powers worked very closely with the applicant, with the community board, with the borough president, with all of the stakeholders uh, throughout this entire process, and I'm I'm really proud of the amazing job that he's done, the responsible uh, way he's handled this, the thoughtful nature and how he's approached this. It was complicated and not easy and went on from the first day he was elected to the council. So I'm really grateful for his leadership. Keeping one of the largest private employers in New York City in Midtown is a big deal. So I want to thank him for his leadership. And I want to thank J.P. Morgan for listening carefully throughout this process. We'll be voting on two applications of Majority Leader Lori Cumbo's office, 1050 Pacific Rezoning, Pacific Street Rezoning. It's going to create 103 units of housing, 31 of which will be affordable units, and 1010 Pacific Street Rezoning. It's going to facilitate 124 units of housing, 39, which will be affordable. We're going to vote on 1640 Flatbush Avenue Rezoning. It will enable the development of a mixed-use building with 114 units of housing, including 29 affordable units in Council District 45. Uh, former council member, current public advocate, Jumani Williams District, and the Council will be modifying the application to remove mandatory inclusionary option two and add mandatory inclusionary option one. We're going to vote on 1921 Atlantic Avenue, a series of applications to allow for the development of a 14-story mixed-use building with 236 units of affordable housing in Council Member Amprey Samuels District. And I want to thank the staff who worked on all of these, uh, Rosa Kelly, Brian Paul, 
Chelsea uh, Kelly and Raju Mann, the director of our land use division. Moving on, the council will be voting on the following pieces of, resolu of, of legislation and resolutions. Resolution 828, sponsored by Councilmember Carlos Machaca, the chair of our immigration committee, commends the New York State Office of Court Administration for promulgating rules that require a judicial warrant for any civil arrest in New York State Court, in a New York State Court, and it calls on the legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act in order to protect people from civil arrest while at such court proceeding. The new OCA rules in this bill in Albany will help ICE uh, stay out of our courts, which is important. Their presence in and around our courthouses breaks trust between immigrant communities and local law enforcement and courts. And uh, I'm really proud we're doing this today. I wanna thank the staff who worked on this, Harbani Ahuja and Elizabeth Kronk. We're gonna vote on Introduction 562, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, which would require that owners of multiple dwellings post notice in the common area of the building stating the relevant hurricane evacuation zone number for that building and providing information on the presence of evacuation centers. Congratulations, Mark. And I wanna thank the staff who worked on this bill, Brad Reed and Joshua Kingsley. Introduction 10, introduction 1533, sponsored by public advocate Jumani Williams, would extend the June 1st 2019 compliance deadline by which workers and supervisors must obtain a portion of the training required by local law 196 of 2017 to, to December 1st, 2019, and allows the Department of Buildings to further extend that deadline by another six months if necessary. I wanna thank the staff who worked on this bill, uh, Gene and Zilka and Megan Chen. The next package of bills is near and dear to my heart because we're dealing with really critically important housing issues and I'm very proud we're taking action today to protect tenants. All too often, landlords who are using unscrupulous methods to get people out of their apartments to try and increase or unlock the value of their buildings use multiple strategies to get that done. These methods, which the New York Times exposed about a year ago in a detailed and meticulous series include construction as harassment, taking advantage of lax enforcement of laws meant to protect tenants, landlords lying about the existence of tenants on construction documents, landlords making unfair buyout offers to tenants, and a lack of due process in housing court proceedings. Today, we are doing something about that. Building upon the council's work last session to address tenant harassment, the council is passing 17 pieces of legislation that addresses these unscrupulous methods and finally holds unscrupulous landlords accountable. The first three bills we'll be voting on are by council member Helen Rosenthal. I wanna congratulate her. Introduction 1279, we require the Department of Buildings and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to verify that building owners are correcting dangerous building and housing maintenance code violations. Introduction 1280 would require that construction permit applications contain a statement signed by the owner and applicant identifying any occupied units in the building and the bill would also establish specific civil and criminal penalties for lying on these forms to obtain a building permit. In introduction 1107, when a building owner wants to do major construction in a building with residential tenants, the owner must submit a tenant protection plan with the building permit application. This bill would shift the responsibility of retaining a design professional to prepare a tenant protection plan from building owners to contractors. It would require statements by building owners and contractors regarding the occupancy of a building and the scope of work of a construction project. Next up, we're gonna vote on introduction uh, 1242, sponsored by Council Member Diana Ayala, which would expand the Department of Housing Preservation and Development's online property owner registry by requiring inclusion of a Department of Building violation related to construction as harassment, including violations of work without a permit and work in violation of a stop work order. It would also require HPD to include rent overcharge information from the state and incorporate that information into this registry uh, if that information becomes available to HPD from the state. It's a very important bill, so congratulations, uh, Diana. 
Uh, we're going to vote on two bills introduced by Council Member Alika Apri Samuel. Introduction 1277 will require the Department of Buildings to perform preliminary inspections to verify the occupancy status of a building when an owner claims a building permit application, when they claim on a building permit application that the building is unoccupied. And introduction 1241, currently under DOB's professional certification program, design professionals may sign off on building permit applications without review by DOB. This bill would expand liability for false professional certifications to the offending registered design professional supervisor as well as the professional personally. <clears throat> Introduction uh, 1278, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, would require the Department of Buildings to approve tenant protection plans prior to construction and to periodically inspect construction sites to ensure compliance with the plan. Introduction 1275, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers, will deny permits for one year for a building following a determination that a false statement about the occupancy status was made on a construction application for that building or following a determination that the work was conducted without a permit while such building was occupied. We're going to vote on three bills by Councilmember uh, Robert Cornegie, who's the chair of our Housing and Buildings Committee. Uh, introduction 1258. Currently, the only way for a tenant to know when they are being evicted is by being served with court papers. This is basic due process for anyone being sued. Unfortunately, we have heard many reports of tenants not being notified when a landlord starts an eviction proceeding against them. This bill would require that the Department of Consumer Affairs annually audit the records of at least 20% of licensed process servers who have served notices for a housing court proceeding. This bill would require that DCA post on its website and notify process serving agencies when a process service license has been suspended, revoked, and a license renewal is denied. Introduction 59, owners often try to persuade tenants to vacate their units by offering them a sum of money, a practice known as a buyout offer. This bill requires that landlords offering buyouts to tenants disclose that there is no guarantee that the tenant will find a similar apartment in the same community district with the same number of bedrooms for the same rent that the tenant is currently paying and that additional factors may impact their ability to obtain other housing. And introduction 1257 would require DOB to issue a stop work order if an inspector is unable to gain access to a construction site and has reason to believe that the work is being done in violation of the law. Introduction uh, 1247, sponsored by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, would require owners of residential buildings to provide copies of any notice of violation issued against a property to the residents of that property. Additionally, the Department of Buildings must create a pamphlet or flyer explaining the adjudication process for such violations to be distributed with copies of notices of violations so tenants can participate in the adjudication process. I know Council Burke worked very hard in this bill and I want to congratulate him for its passage today. Introduction 977, sponsored by Council Member Antonio Reynoso, would permit the Department of Buildings to sanction registered design professionals if a professionally certified application that is submitted to DOB contains an error that results in a stop work order. It would also require that DOB maintain a database of registered design professionals who have been excluded, suspended, or otherwise sanctioned by DOB. Introduction 1171, sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres, will require the Department of Buildings to obtain information from the Department of Finance and the state in order to identify cases of false statements regarding occupied and rent regulated housing. Several audits are also required by this bill. DOB would be required to conduct an audit of an owner's entire portfolio of properties if the owner has been caught either failing to obtain a building permit or submitting false statements regarding occupied uh, and rent regulated housing on an application for a building permit. DOB would also be required to audit 25% of buildings on the Department of Housing, Housing Preservation and Development's speculation watch list for compliance with building permit requirements on an annual basis and audit all buildings owned by landlords who have submitted an unusually high number of amended building permits. If DOB finds that an owner has made a false statement, DOB must notify the City Council, the Department of Investigation, the Division of Housing, Community and Renewal, and the Tenant Protection Unit 
after, and also refer the matter to the relevant district attorney and attorney general for potential criminal prosecution and report on the punitive actions it took in every case in which it found evidence of a falsified application for a building permit. Introduction 975, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon, would require the Department of Buildings to deny a construction permit for buildings with a significant number of open, dangerous building and housing maintenance code violations. The law would allow for permits for work to correct the violations or for emergency work. And finally, we'll vote on two bills sponsored by Councilmember Mark Levine. Introduction 1274 will require owners of multiple dwellings to provide tenants with a previous four years of rent history from the state where available for their apartment, very important. And introduction 551, which require that where owners enter into buyout agreements with their tenants, the owners must submit certain information about the terms of the agreement with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development within 90 days. A lot of staff worked in this package of bills for a long time, and I want to thank uh, all of them. They're here somewhere, I believe. I want to thank Austin Branford, uh, Janine Zilka, Christopher Sartori, Audrey Son, Jay Suri, uh, Ganapathy, Brenda McKinney, Nicholas Connell, Megan Chen, Brad Reed, Jeff Baker, and Laura Popa. I want to thank the amazing staff for uh, their uh, really hard work on this complicated package of bills. I was in Albany yesterday. Uh, I met with Speaker Hasty. I met with uh, the Housing Committee Chair, Steve Simberwitz, in the Assembly. I met with Majority Leader Andrew Stewart-Cousins, and the focus of those meetings was a strengthening of our rent laws over the next six to seven weeks and ensuring that we do not lose more rent regulated units. We repeal vacancy decontrol. We get rid of the vacancy bonus. We eliminate MCIs and IAIs. We push for good cause eviction and all the other bills that tenants have been pushing for for years. It was a very good day. And sadly, we don't have authority because of the Erstat law over our rent laws, but we do have authority in this area. So to use this package of bills, coupled with hopefully the strengthening of our rent laws, will make a big difference on behalf of tenants. We're in a housing crisis, we're in a homelessness crisis, we have to keep people in their homes, and we're in the midst of an affordability crisis. So I am really grateful, and the person who ran this package of bills uh, for us is Rob Newman, my counsel, uh, so I'm really grateful for his hard work and leadership in shepherding this through after I brought this to him a little more than a year ago after I saw the New York Times story. So I want to thank everyone. Before we conclude today's agenda, uh, Jake Kern is leaving. He is, uh, works in the press office. It is his last stated, and uh, he has been a press officer. He is moving to D.C. to get back into grad school, and I have known him since he was a volunteer on my first campaign in 2012. He was a high school student. He was an intern in my office before he applied for a job here, and I am really grateful for uh, everything that he's done, and I want to say good luck, Jake. So thank you. So that concludes today's agenda for today's state of meeting, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Congratulations to all my colleagues who are passing bills. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you so much, and congratulations to all of those who have put forward really impactful legislation today. We will now have communication uh, with our general orders, and we are going to begin general orders with Councilmember Carlina Rivera. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your leadership and, of course, for the support of all the amazing, uh, talented central staff that you just named. We honestly can't do our work as legislators if it wasn't for all of you. And, of course, on finalizing this package of bills that focuses on protecting the tenant, we have many responsibilities, but one of our most sacred duties is, of course, to protect the residents of New York City from illegal and egregious behavior. As a housing organizer at Good Lower East Side, and of course, a, a tenant service provider, I've heard horror story after horror story. In a neighborhood like the Lower East Side, which is ravaged by gentrification with thousands displaced over the years, we have seen some of the worst, worst cases when it comes to private landlords. Frivolous litigation, deprivation of services, and most relevant, I think, to this package is harassment and the many times that construction is weaponized as harassment. So my bill, 1278A, heightens scrutiny of tenant protection plans and increases enforcement of our building code standards. TPPs, they exist to really preserve the quality of life of New Yorkers. And that New York Times article, that series from May 2018, 
It featured a photograph in the print edition of a press conference that I was at on Ridge Street where the conditions were borderline unlivable. And why it, this issue is so personal to me is that that building was directly across the street from the building where I spent almost my entire life. So this issue has become incredibly important to me. I've seen my neighborhood change. And really, I just want to thank everyone for the work. Uh, that work led me here right to the city council. And I thank everyone for their support. And I thank you in advance for voting yes on these 17 bills that we so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rivera. We will now move into reports of standing committees. None. Oh. Report of the Committee on Finance, pre-considered LU405 and Reso 871 through pre-considered LU409 and Reso 875 tax exemptions. A couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, Intro 562A, Evacuation Center Information. Amended a couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, Intro 59A through Intro 1533 on page 6, Housing Package. Amended a couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 386 and Reso 876 through LU 389 and Reso 879, 1921, Atlantic Avenue. A couple of general orders. LU 390, 270 Park Avenue. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. <clears throat> Excuse me, LU 391 and Reso 880 through LU 394 and Reso 883, Pacific Street rezoning. Couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. Pre considered M161 and Reso 884, approving the redesignation of Joseph Puma, Civilian Complaint Review Board. Couple of general orders. Pre considered M162 and Reso 885, approving the redesignation of Nathan N. Joseph, Civilian Complaint Review Board. Couple of general orders. On the general order calendar, LU 379 and Reso 886 through LU 390 and Reso 888. Couple of general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Couple of general orders at this time, I'm asking for a roll call vote on all of the items on today's general order calendar. Adams. Aye and all. Ampri Samuel. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. I am very proud of the development at 1921 Atlantic Avenue. This project was really truly incorporated the voice of the community in Ocean Hill and in Bed-Stuy and the leadership at Community Board 3. This was a win for everyone. Families who are homeless have an opportunity to find a beautiful, safe space for their families and those who are looking for affordable housing. And the developers also won. They're a small NWBE company headed by an African-American woman who we are very proud of. It also includes affordable space for a local community-based organization, cultural art space, and an urban farmer, as well as a focus on access to healthy food. Again, thank you for this opportunity, and I am so, 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 so excited about what's to come at 1921 Atlantic Avenue. And just briefly, um, intro 1277 and intro 1241, which I did sponsor, I just want to say thank you to um, the speaker and the whole council on your leadership. This speaks directly to this body for being accountable, transparent, and responsive to the needs of New Yorkers. The bill expands sanctions, not just to the individual, but firms. A process, there's a process for reinstatement and compliance training, and my favorite part, a database to include the names of those who have been violators and their firms. While the state is doing what they have to do, I'm so glad to be a part of this body and my colleagues for doing what we're supposed to do in the city, and that's doing the right thing. So thank you very much. Thank you, and congratulations. Ayala. Aye on all. Barron. I vote aye on all with the exception of land use 379, 380, and land use 391 through 394, and the accompanying resolutions on which I'm voting no. And to my sister, Alika Ampli Samuel, way to go. That's a great project. Congratulations. Borelli. Uh, permission to vote on all land use call-ups? Permission granted. I vote aye. Uh, and uh, with respect to the others, I vote aye on all except for 59A, 551A, 975, 1258, 1277, 1278, 1280, 
uh, and M162 and the accompanying resolution 885. Congratulations to all the sponsors, even those that I voted against. Cabrera. Vote aye. I want to thank uh, the speaker and also Chair Carnegie uh, for your support uh, on my bill, and I congratulate uh, all my colleagues. Aye or no? Thank you. Chin. Congratulations to my colleagues on the strong tenant protection bills, and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Mario. No on M162885. Uh, 59A, 551, 975, 1258, 1277, 1278, 1280, and I on the rest. Cohen. Aye. Constantinidis. I would I. Carnegie. Uh, congratulations to all my colleagues on this great bill, on the great package of bills on tenant protections. I don't know. Mr. Chair, you were key in making it happen, so thank you. Deutsch. Aye. Diaz. Yes, on all except resolution 82088. I'm voting no on that one. Yes, on the rest. Have a good day. Drum. Aye. Espinal. Uh, with many congratulations to Alika Epri Samuel for bringing affordable housing into our side of the world, uh, I vote aye. Eugene. Uh, I vote aye. Gibson. With my warmest congratulations to all of my colleagues that have introduced uh, bills related to tenant protection and keeping rents affordable in our city and ensuring that our tenants are not harassed um, by unscrupulous landlords. Certainly many residents in my district would positively be impacted by this package. So I want to thank our chair of housing and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Gorenchik. Aye. Kalos. Aye. King. I'd like to vote aye on all except for land use 379, 380, and congratulations to everyone who's passed legislation today to improve the lives of the city of New York. Ku. I vote aye, and I want to congratulate uh, all the council members who passed the bills today. Thank you. Thank you. Kozlowitz. Aye, I know. Lanceman. Aye. Lander. Aye. Levin. Mizell. Yes. Menchaca. Aye and all. Moya. Aye. Perkins. Congratulations to all whose bills have been passed. I vote aye on all. Powers. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. I'll now talk about my uh, project <laughs> at 270 Park Avenue. I appreciate uh, your passion. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I am, I am proud of this project today because a few years ago, my predecessor in this body did a rezoning in East Midtown with the intention of creating and preserving jobs uh, right here in Midtown or right there in Midtown, uh, near Grand Central, near Penn Station in a transit-rich area, but to also really modernize an area that desperately needed new office space and be able to preserve the jobs that we're trying to keep here in New York City. This is the first project. We're getting 14,000 plus jobs are gonna stay here in the East Midtown in New York City at J.P. Morgan considered options all around the tri-state area. We're getting 6,000 construction jobs, all union. We're maintaining all the building service workers that are working there today. They will have places to work and they'll be back on site, hundreds of them. $42 million for public realm improvements in Midtown around Grand Central thousands of new sidewalks and expansion space around this site and much more. Uh, I'm happy of this. I want to thank my, actually my predecessor, Dan Garodnik, the borough president, the, and, and many others who worked tirelessly to rezone that area. And thank you to all the staff here who have my staff for their help uh, to help get this project through and to send a sign that New York is always willing to embrace those who are here to create jobs, be, be, be willing and active participants in our process here. And I want to thank J.P. Morgan for their cooperation throughout this process and being a responsible 
uh, a responsible company here in New York City, our largest employer, and today we are maintaining them here for the very long future and uh, very, very happy with the work that we're doing here today. So with that, thank you, and I vote aye on all. Thanks. Thank you. Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Richards. Aye on all. Rivera. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Salamanca. Aye and all. Torres. Aye and all. Traeger. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you, Majority Leader. I want to thank Speaker Johnson and my colleagues for moving intro 562 forward for a vote uh, before the Council today. This vital piece of legislation is coming forward at a critical time as our planet is warming at record speed, creating unpredictable and inclement weather patterns, leading to an increase in natural disasters. We learned from the city's response to Superstorm Sandy that critical information, like how, when, and where to evacuate to, never trickled down to the most vulnerable communities at the front lines of the storm's devastation. During Sandy, my district, along with other coastal neighborhoods throughout the city, do not have adequate access to information about evacuation procedures, when to go, where to go, how to get there, or where the nearest emergency center was located. Amid the chaos and confusion, we saw many high-rise apartment building residents who, who did not or could not evacuate, stranded without power sometimes for days. As a matter of fact, 37% uh, of residents in Zone A, in Flood Zone A, did not evacuate under uh, mandatory evacuation orders. My bill, a direct response to, to those uh, painful lessons learned, will help close a dangerous communication gap between government and residents. As the impact and threat of climate change grows, we must ensure all New Yorkers have access to this kind of critical life-saving uh, information. With Sandy, there were over 285 fatalities. During Katrina, over 1,800. With Hurricane Maria, over 3,000 fatalities. Emergency preparedness is key to planning for future emergencies, and my bill expands on the safety measures necessary to facilitate safe evacuations should another natural disaster occur. Um, intro 526 will bring us a step closer to this objective by mandating that apartment buildings will be required to post hurricane evacuation and shelter information and have it available all year round, not just during or right after a natural disaster, and it will be accessible in, in multiple languages as well. I thank my colleagues for their support, and I vote aye, and congratulations to all my colleagues on their great bills today. Thank you. Ulrich. Valone. Aye and all. Van Bramer. Aye and all. Jaeger. Aye and all, with the exception of 551, 1247, and 1257. Thank you. Thank you. The combo. I vote aye. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye and all. Please allow for a moment while we tally the votes, and also we have to make sure that no one else um, leaves at this time because we are concerned about keeping quorum. All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, with LUs 391, 392 with accompanying resos. Give us one moment.
I'll begin again, LUs 391, 392 with accompanying resos, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. LUs 393, 394 with accompanying resos, 45 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. And M162 plus res, Reso 885, 44 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions. LUs 379, 380, and accompanying resos, 44 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions. Intros 59A, 975A, uh, 1258A, 1277A, 1278A, 1280A, a, which was adopted by a vote of 44 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions. Intro 551A, which was adopted by a vote of 43 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions. Intro 1247A, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 1257A, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions. The revised land use call-ups vote is 46 affirmative and zero negative. Introduction and reading of bills. We are now going to move into introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. We will now move into the discussion of resolutions. Are there any members who wish to speak on today's resolutions? Seeing none, I will begin with reading our first resolution onto the record. An amended resolution, resolution 828A, commending the New York State Office of Court Administration for promulgating rules that require a judicial warrant for any civil arrest in a New York State court and calling on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act, A2176 and S425, in order to further protect certain interested parties or people from civil arrest while going to, remaining at, or returning from the place of such court proceeding. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Thank you, and we will now move into general discussion. I have on the docket for general discussion, beginning with Council Members King, followed by Kalos, followed by Yeager. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Last week, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a ban on our alcohol advertising on city property, including bus shelters, newsstands, phone booth, Wi-Fi link, NYC kiosks, and recycling kiosks. Why? As the deputy mayor Playanco said, alcohol advertisement can influence how much alcohol people drink and how young they are when they start. This executive order closes a loophole and reaffirms this administration's commitment to advancing policies that promote health equity and build healthier communities. While I applaud these efforts as well as MTA's decision in 2017 to ban these ads on our buses, subways, we need to go a step further. As someone who is a youth advocate, educator, and firmly believes that our children are our future, as we all do believe and have our own children in our household, today I'm introducing legislation that will amend Chapter 5 of Title 28 of the Administrative Code which will ban alcohol advertisements within 500 feet of any school. The reasons why, the same reason as the administration that we need to promote healthy equity, build healthier communities, and ensure our boys and girls are not influenced by pictures and messages designed to make alcohol look cool. How often do you look at a school and right across the street of bodegas advertising Budweiser, Heineken, or in addition to the hookah bar um, smokes and so forth. So I'm asking us all to do our part and help us save our children by signing on this piece of legislation that can stop advertisement and can do the most harmful thing to our children, start them to drink and alcohol at an early age. If we can do this with city buildings, if we can ban Budweiser or any ad on any ad or bus stop, but not stop the bodega right down the street or across the street from a school, then we are, for, we are a failure to our schools and our children that attend schools. So I'm asking us all today, let's be consistent and I ask you all to sign on to our intro today to make sure that we save the lives of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember King. Councilmember Kalos, again followed by Councilmember Yeager. I believe in climate change. I believe it was caused by humans and that we can do something about it. 
time New York City to join nearly 400 cities, districts, and countries across the world, representing over 34 million people collectively that have recently declared or officially acknowledged the existence of a global climate emergency. Please join Environmental Committee Chair Costa Constantinides and I on Resolution 864, declaring a climate emergency, calling for an immediate emergency mobilization to restore a safe climate and continue much of the work that our Environmental Committee Chair Costa has already been doing with this council and leading our great nation and the world. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd just uh, like to briefly echo Mr. Speaker's remarks earlier. Uh, very grateful for those who have uh, expressed their condolences on the passing of former member of this body, Lou Fiddler. Uh, as Mr. Speaker said, he was a hero to many. Um, he was my leader, he was my friend, he was my mentor. Um, he started a lot of careers in public service, uh, including my own. So if anybody wants to blame him for that, feel free. Um, but he was a tremendous public servant. Uh, in every way he lived, he lived to serve the people. And uh, even to his last moments, we were speaking the day before he passed away. Um, just about public service and about things that I was planning and I'm going to speak about one of them right now. Um, but I, again, I am grateful for everybody uh, here in this chamber, the extended council family and to my fellow New Yorkers uh, for their kind words over the last few days. Um, Madam President, I am introducing today <clears throat> introduction 1556 along with um, Councilman Chaim Deutsch and a number of other members of this body who have already signed on. Uh, this is the House of Worship Security Act. Um, and it's quite simple uh, in its application. It is structured similarly to the Non-Public School Safety Act that were, was enacted a number of years ago in this body, uh, sponsored by my predecessor, Councilman Greenfield. And what it would provide is that any house of worship in the city which uh, wishes to uh, hire a private security guard can submit for a reimbursement to the city of New York. Um, what we've seen over the last several months, uh, especially uh, over the last several months, um, most significantly, Pittsburgh, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, San Diego, too numerous to mention churches all across these, these United States that have been subject to attack. Uh, people who go to the one place, and Madam President, I know my clock is going to tick. I'll just beg your indulgence. People who go to the one place where they know Madam Majority, that there, I ask that Councilmember Yeager have as much time as he needs, given he spent a significant amount of time talking about his friend and our former colleague, Councilmember uh, former Councilmember Fiddler, so I would ask that Councilmember Yeager has as much time as he wants to to discuss the bill that he's introducing today. Thank Very you, much. Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, the one place where I believe that uh, it is universally accepted that people are safe without worry behind them is in the sanctuary of prayers that they attend, whatever religion they are. And what we've seen over the last several months in particular, Jews, Christians, Muslims, in their houses of worship, viciously attacked, targeted people praying. This bill, if enacted, would give people in our city the comfort knowing that they can go into their house of worship and feel safe. It's not to say that our police can't protect us. It's to say that the resources of the police department are limited. We know that. They can't put a police car in front of every house of worship. They can't put a police officer standing in front of every house of worship. It's another way to look at it an opportunity to hire a private security guard and ask the taxpayers, us and the people we represent, to pay a little bit to get this done. I would urge my colleagues uh, to sign on to introduction 1556 to get this done for the people of New York. Mr. Speaker, again, thank you uh, for your indulgence, Madam President, and uh, for allowing me to express my thoughts on Lou. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. We will now go to Councilmember Traeger, Reynoso, and Eugene. Thank you, Majority Leader. And I just also want to just dedicate uh, some time to also pay tribute uh, to uh, our, my colleague and friend, uh, former Councilman Lou Fidler, um, who was a uh, champion for education, champion for our youth, uh, in so many different ways. And I just want to share with my colleagues and the public that one of the last messages I received from Lou Fidler was about over a week ago when he messaged me, uh, he, he worked for the borough president, and he was working on a project to fund mobile uh, 
showers to help homeless individuals who are in need. And he wanted to make sure that that was advancing in the Brooklyn delegation and the city council. That's the type of person Lou Fidler was and, and will always be. And just to know, Lou, I'm, we're going to work to make sure that that, that happens uh, in this budget. And so uh, our prayers and our thoughts are with his uh, beautiful family and all those impacted by this tremendous loss to Brooklyn and to New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Council Member Reynoso? Uh, just want to also acknowledge uh, the work that uh, Council Member Lou Fidler did. And I just want to talk about a, a time when um, I had originally met him. Uh, when I was 22 years old, I was running to, to be a county committee member. And it was how I was born into politics. And is where I met Lou Fidler, who was extremely loyal to the party uh, leader at that time. And I was an insurgent new to, to the game, and um, many rules were being changed the, the day I went to the county committee meeting. And I remember specifically Lou Fidler standing up and thinking a lot of the changes that were being made were unnecessary and unjust. Um, a person who morally side with, sided with me, even though we were on different camps when it came to the work that we were doing in county committee. And I've never forgotten that day when he stood up, and I felt like he was an ally with me at that moment, um, just uh, his, how morally sound he was in pushing issues that he thought were important. So I also um, want to make sure that we don't forget his memory and the work that he did for young people, um, but for always standing up for what's right when he thought that it was an injustice being done. So I also wanted to take time to just say that story because it's never left my, my mind since I've known him, um, and it will never be forgotten even after. So thank you again for taking the time, for allowing me to speak on, on the life of Lou Fidler. Thank you. And finally, Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much. I just want to take a minute also to pay tribute to our colleague, former colleague, Lou Fidler. When the speaker said that Lou Fidler was a hero, a champion for youth, he was uh, right. Because I remember when I was leading my non-for-profit organization, a youth organization, that was not in Lou Fidler district, the organization Youth for Education in Sport, I went to see former council member Lou Fidler to ask him for his support for my organization. He did support my organization. He became one of the strongest supporters of my organization. That was not in his district, and that was remarkable. And when I became a city council member, I was a member of the Youth Services Committee. I witnessed his dedication, his love in serving young people and making sure that all the young people, they have the resources that they need to go up and to become positive citizens. When I became the chairman of the Youth Services Committee, I was also inspired by Lou Fidler. And I just want to take this moment also to join my colleagues and the speaker to pay tribute to Lou Fidler. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Eugene. I just want to close out with um, many of you may have seen the little three-year-old girl who uh, was tragically murdered. Um, and I wrote a statement about it, and I just wanted to read it. It says, the African proverb says, the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. A mother, Sharon Coleman, and her entire village are traumatized and forever broken as they mourn the loss of their angel, Zoe while no prayers or condolences can bring her back or comfort her family. We can no longer condone or simply accept the killing of black women or children because of the very real symptoms of the post-traumatic slave syndrome that impacts all of us each and every day. I am outraged, angry, saddened, and depressed. The most powerful way that we can demonstrate that black lives matter is to show that black lives matter to us, especially our babies. As matriarchs all over the world are getting ready to celebrate Mother's Day with their family and children, this black mother deserved to celebrate this holiday and special occasion with her angel. Please continue to express your outrage and do not accept this type of behavior as your norm. Our silence equates to our acceptance and we should not accept this. I do not accept this. And I certainly want to, as a mom, uh, my heart and my prayers go out to this mother and her entire family and the devastation that they and all of us must be feeling at this time. Thank you, and I will now call on Speaker Corey Johnson to close today's meeting. I'm grateful for Lou Fidler. 
and I'm thinking of his family in the stated meeting of March of May 8th, 2019, 2000, the stated meeting of May 8th, 2019 is hereby adjourned. <laughs>